Hello and welcome follow subscribers and other racing fans. Today with a special episode of Setup 101 we will be creating a baseline setup for the Aston Martin V12 Vantage GT3. Why are we doing this you ask and what for? Well basically we need a setup for the Aston Martin as a starting point for future setup 101s. The plan with that is to have shorter episodes of setup 101s in the future for specific tracks. Also it will take a while to go through all the tracks you want to try with a GT3 car. So I want to make sure you have something until I have a setup 101 for each track. Yeah. So as a base I want to do a setup you will be presented today. I got asked a lot about making a baseline setup for any GT3 car, especially for the Aston Martin. So well that's another reason reason for that. Um, however I will not explain all the physics behind the changes I will give you. First of all we won't be able to do this in a well, 30 minute video that's far too much for that and also I can't really explain all the things so I'm no physics guru so you uh, have to and I think you will live with that. Last thing, um, why the Aston? Why do I choose the Aston? Well that should be uh, obvious, shouldn't it? You did see my channel graphics and the stuff, right? So where do we start? Well first of all we need to know the strengths and weaknesses of the car we want to tune. Then we need to know the purpose of our setup. So well, if it's for racing purposes or time trial purposes, in this case it will be a race setup. And we also need to consider Picard's uh, specialties, for example the bump and damper behavior which is sometimes a little bit strange, uh, maybe a too stiff bumping stuff going on there, I can't really explain it but the car is losing uh, quite an amount of grip over bumps and curves and stuff like that. And also the track selection would be an, a thing uh, to consider. In Project Cars we have currently a good mix of tracks, so mostly medium size tracks I would say. That's also dependent on your race calendar in a league for example. Good. As I told you we need to know the strengths and weaknesses of our car. So let's just gather some information about the Aston Martin. What do we have there? Uh, what experience did we made in the past? Strengths of the Aston. First of all, torque power. This car with 600 newton meter and over 500 horsepower on sea level is a beast. That's a huge, a huge power and torque advantage to many of the other cars in the GT3 field, in the PCAS GT3 field we have to say. Second, the accelerating which is due to the torque and power of course, accelerating out from uh, medium corners, also from slow corners is really something else. You can out accelerate other cars pretty swiftly with this car. However, also, um, not also, keep in mind when shifted correctly, yeah? This car has a huge V12 engine with a relatively small restrictor on it, so the usable power is in the low revs. So don't rev the engine too much if you are an external cam and use the external MoTeC display. Please shift the car when the second line of lights go on in the motor. Okay, third thing, top speed. Although 
it doesn't have the best top speed of all cars, that would be the SLS, it does have a really, really good top speed. It's on par with the McLaren, for example, tops out at 290 kilometers on most tracks. It can be faster, however, that's not easily done because the revs are too high then and the power is missing. So top speed generally on most tracks, if it's not Bathurst and uh, Le Mans is quite an strength of the air. Also weight distribution. This car has a weight balance of about 50-50, so that's great. This car has really great weight balance. We need to have this in mind while setting up the car, for example for the weight buyers. The car already has a really really nice weight distribution. Well, now then let's come to the weaknesses of the V12 SM Martin. First of all, torque and power. Yes, I did it. I took the same bullet point for both strength, strengths and weaknesses of the car. A reason for that, sometimes we have problems um, with delivering the torque and power on the track. You know, the grip uh, needs to be there to uh, deliver the power of the engine and sometimes in the Aston we have that problem of a power oversteering. So uh, there's something uh, we need to do about this. Second, understeering in medium paced corners. You might have seen me struggling around Silverstone. The same ha is happening around Bruno, the Czech, re the, the track in Czech Republic. <laughs> Oh, that was difficult. The car is understeering quite a lot on medium paced corners. In slow corners it's okay, in fast corners I would say it's okay. But in medium paced corners problems, always problems with understeer. Third, left and right combinations. S's for example. Also Silverstone, a prime example again. Maggot Beckett's um, kind of a problem in this car. It is, it feels very stable, but it is not at the same time. So there is something we need to do about that as well. However, this is maybe more a um, driving line thing than a setup thing, but we will see if we can do anything about that. Okay. Fourth thing is the brakes, not the best brakes. We are kind of struggling with understeering with the brakes and at the same time not the strongest brakes in the field. So braking um, takes a little bit more time in this car. Fifth thing, bumps in the road. I'm not sure if you have already noticed but um, within the GT3 field the Aston is certainly the car with the worst bump behavior. It's it's really awful. M maybe the roof. The roof is one of those cars uh, which is even worse because when it hits a bump it's just jumping around for 50 meters. But also the Aston, um, if the front axle is hitting a bump you can be sure you will be understeering into the grass or gravel trap or whatever. It just, um, it just breaks a uh, grip and well that's not what we want. Also as a last point the starts are a problem. That's because of the gearbox. Well that should be the main problem at least and I will tell you something about that in the setup. However most GT3 racing is um, done with rolling starts so the problem is not there with rolling starts and we won't specially uh, try to uh, um, desperately um, try to improve the standing start in the SM Martin. Now that we know, let's go and check out the setup and see what we can do here. Select the right car and the right livery of course, although we won't be seeing it much I can tell you. You're going on the track 
just for the ambient sounds which the track gives us to us it's not related to the track at all don't be afraid no dubai incoming good starting with a fresh setup here going directly into it and we are starting with the brake pressure usually in gt3 we are racing with abs so brake pressure can be increased to 100 percent that gives you a better brake behavior meaning um, the brakes start to work earlier and harder however it also might make the car a little bit unstable in short braking maneuvers yeah if you are in a left right combination and you're tapping the brake short the full brake pressure could cause a little bit too much braking well it all depends on your on your foot yeah if you can brake with um, with feel then of course that doesn't exp um, apply to you okay so with the brakes, what problem do we want to fight? We want to fight the not so nice braking behavior of the Aston Martin. And as I said, it is understeering in many occasions. Also with the brakes. First of all, we're increasing the brake pressure to 95. That's a compromise. We are helping with the brake power a little bit without um, getting into too much instabilities in uh, those situations I just described. The brake balance. 60% is okay on many tracks like maybe Monza or Bathurst where you need to break down from huge or from very high um, speeds. However, on most other tracks my experience um, said reducing the brake balance a little bit helps with the car um, turning in better, getting less understeering and that's what we want to achieve after all. So brake balance, I reduce it usually to 58 on some tracks, I also use 57 or 56, it also depends on um, the, the track of course and um, the, the situation you are in, if you are in a longer race you might need to adjust the brake balance anyway because front tires give up a little bit earlier maybe so you get under steering so you might want to reduce the brake balance a little bit to the rear 58 nice value for me that's a very personal value you can change that if you want brake ducts uh, 75 are actually quite okay for most tracks traction control slip You've seen me increasing that to 15%. I also tried it with 9%. The higher you go, obviously, the more power oversteering you will get. And the lower you go, the more well, um, torque and power during the acceleration phases you will lose. Because the traction control gets too cautious and it takes away too much power for accelerating out of corners. A compromise with that is always put it in the middle between default and the highest so 12 maybe 11 12 that's a wonderful value. We don't need to talk about uh, the tire compound this is of course uh, different for all um, occasions um, how you need it the soft tire obviously doesn't um, last very very long it lasts maybe 50 50 minutes 45 minutes of racing after that you might want to use the medium tire for the hard compound there is no real use in project cars so far tire pressures that's a completely other story. You might know from the patch 6.0 we want um, or we have problems with overheating tires. So 
we might leave it on default to not get into the problems of overheating the tires however in my ex ex in my experience over the last days reducing the pressure slightly helped getting a little bit more grip out of the car and didn't increase tire wear or tire temps too much <clears throat> i usually drove values about two bar in the front up to 2.1 bar and accordingly 1.9 bar to 2 bar in the rear. Let's set it up with 2.1 bar and 2 bar in the rear. Obviously the higher you go with the pressure you have the chance to reduce tire temps a little bit because the tire does less work in itself so there is um, less heat building up. Of course there is a certain point where this isn't working anymore. If the, the tire is too much pumped you will get understeering and or oversteering as well and therefore heating the tire too much. This is a nice compromise you see here. For courses that are right handed like the Dubai course here you might want to reduce uh, the right pressures a little bit re relatively to the left pressures because the right tires tend to be a little bit too cool on right-handed tracks. For left-handed tracks this is vice versa, obviously. <coughs> okay, first page done, next settings. Fuel loads we will leave it at 60 or just play around with it now um, put it to 55 liters so we have half a tank we will do a short test lap after um, the explanation of the setup so we use half a tank to see if it works nicely with a race setup brake mapping i did mention one weakness is the understeer and although we won't have any help from the brake mapping with that we can um, we can use a certain driving technique in combination with this to reduce the understeering in corners what does the brake mapping if you increase the brake mapping the engine doesn't break the car so much well that means the computer in the in the car applies um, a little bit of throttle so the car engine if you go off throttle completely doesn't lose so much um, RPMs. That can help in certain situations however I prefer to put it down to 5 here so the engine brakes a little bit better. This also gets you a little bit more speed reduction and in the end effect a little bit better turn in behavior. Restrictor obviously we leave it at the maximum restrictor here as we need all the air we can get. Next setting um, the gearbox gearing settings we can't change the gears they are um, fixed I mean you can put the sliders to other um, to other points here however as you can see they are all the same ratio so you just um, would exchange the fifth with the sixth gear for example it, it doesn't help for anything so these gearing are nothing for us to play with however the final drive we have two settings on the Aston the low setting, the acceleration setting and the high setting, the top speed setting. In general we leave that at default, the reason for that is uh, the car um, loses a little bit of its acceleration with the higher um, setting, with uh, the longer gears, although it has huge amount of torque and power, 
I do not recommend, if you don't need it, to put it to top speed. Only for tracks like Monza, Bathurst, maybe Spa, you will need the top speed. So, the second setting here. Now, let's dive into the differential settings. Nice thing here, we don't need to change the acceleration lock. What does it do? If you increase the acceleration lock, the car certainly accelerates better out of corners, however, that can also mean uh, that you get quite an oversteering. Um, power oversteering out of corners is death in this car. It has so much power, so much torque. So I'll just leave it at default, maybe um, as well reduce it a little bit. However, I got away from reducing the acceleration lock from the experience of the last days. Um, it's more advised, for me at least, to use a little bit of traction control instead of reducing the acceleration lock here to help with power oversteering. The traction control takes away, of course, a little bit of power, however, it works more smoothly and if you have a nice line, the traction control maybe won't even uh, get into action. Yeah? So we leave acceleration lock at the default value. However, the deacceleration lock, that's another story. It's at 30. If we reduce that, you will get more um, oversteering uh, during off throttle situations. Yeah? If you are in front of a corner, you go off throttle, less deceleration lock will get the car um, a better turn in behavior. And if you remember, one of the weaknesses we, s we uh, um, said before is the understeering going into corners and in corners. So going off throttle, we want a little bit of oversteering. You need to be careful with that, however it helps greatly with improving your lap times. 25 is a sweet spot I found and it's also easy to <coughs> sorry also easy to remember because it's 25 for the acceleration lock as well. The limited slip preload as you can read here it's um, a low settings improve maneuverability whilst high settings reduce it. That basically means in on throttle off throttle situations higher preload make the car more unstable and now remember one of the weaknesses in left right corner combinations we have problems getting the car around because it's a bit lazy there so what we do here is increasing the preload a little bit to 120 newton meter That's also a value from experience, it helps the car getting around um, twisty tracks and also other um, corner combinations which, um, which need to um, have a more agile car. Radiator, you have to see it for yourself, I can't tell you, it's different from track to track. If you're unsure, open it up a little bit. As on some tracks, the water and oil temperatures might be on the higher side. Yeah, I won't recommend you to go lower with that in races. Yeah, it's already almost on the limit. Maybe on tracks like Monza, you can go down to 40 percent. However. Not for the baseline setup, I won't recommend you that. Okay, next thing. Bump stops. I've been singing this the whole time. I'm actually not sure if I'm right here, but we will be reducing that. Why do we do this? The bump stops. 
helps with the car if it's buttoning yeah the bump stop is the first thing um, which keeps the car from buttoning too much and uh, maybe destroying the car with that of course you don't want that but in project cars in this uh, simulation people have yet to prove me that it brings you anything to drive with higher bump stops so we will reduce that to five millimeters buttoning out is not a problem the car won't break also with the suspension it won't break from bumps so we can safely reduce the setting what we gain here is a little bit like well, what was it now 20 millimeter uh, reduction so two centimeters um, more workspace for our whole suspension I won't touch the slow bumps because I haven't researched um, too much with with um, uh, these guys the slow bumps are basically there for um, yeah for corner behavior for um, um, for faster corners where the car is um, uh, going into the corner for longer periods of time and we, we don't touch um, those values at all what we will do is making the car softer this will also apply to the next page which are um, springs and it also applies to our fast bumps and fast rebounds as I said one of the weaknesses bump behavior bumps and curbs the car does not want to take bumps and curbs very nicely so we will reduce the fast bumps and fast rebounds to softer values and a sweet spot I found here is three clicks away from default so one two three one two three we do it front and rear the same amount so we don't uh, destroy the car balance which is by the way very nice as I said it also has a 50 50 weight balance and the car balance is generally quite okay except for one thing we will see on the next page now also fast rebounds one two three one two three one two three one two three good next page we're starting out with the springs as I already started the topic we want to make the car softer because it's just too stiff for most tracks we can't take curbs we can't take bumps we might have the real life values here and we also we want a car which is as stiff as possible because that gives you cornering speed and um, the stability of having the same aerodynamic influences all the time however in this case in this simulation we need to reduce them to get better car performance two clicks is a sweet spot I found here 300 Newton per millimeter in the front and accordingly 150 in the rear now I said the car balance is fine in general however if we are speaking about medium sized tracks what we do uh, the rear sway bar is a little bit too conservative now we want to adjust the the car balance here for example in um, medium and in slow speed corners we want that the rear is a little bit more oversteery so we can get around the corners a little bit better what we can do is reducing the front sway bar, softening the front sway bar or stiffening the rear sway bar. I always go, if the track is not too bumpy of course, I always go with stiffening the rear. Why is that? Because a stiffer sway bar helps you 
in corners which are medium to high paced because the car is more stable and can get a uh, higher cornering speed. A nice value here is 28. As I said, if the track is too bumpy, reduce the front sway bar by 4 Newton per millimeter. Now we will reduce the rear, uh, increase the rear sway bar by 4 Newton per millimeter. Right height, a special thing. Generally, right height helps to cope with bumps. So this is something to consider here and it also has influences on the top speed of the car and the cornering speeds and the cornering grip. So what is up with the Aston and right height? Positive thing here, we don't need to bother uh, with aerodynamics and or um, high or top speeds regarding the right height in the car. I tested it many tests at Monza. The top speed of the car on medium sized tracks and longer tracks doesn't increase nor does it decrease with lower or higher right height. So we don't necessarily need to go down with the right height to get more top speed. In other cars that's the case, something to keep in mind, but not in the Aston. What does that mean for us? We only need to consider the grip, the cornering behaviors. And you would be surprised lowering the right height by only 5 mm helps greatly to increase the car performance in corners. However, it also makes the car more twitchy. There is less room for the suspension to work. So maybe the suspension is also working against you sometimes going over curves with too low right height. That's not the perfect thing to do. So what do we do here? We just leave it at default. Default values are quite nice, it's safe for racing and they are also quite fast. Increasing the value I would recommend you at Brands Hatch, for example, at Nürburgring, Nordschleife, maybe also at Bathurst. However, for our purposes, a baseline setup, we just leave it at default. Okay, next page, steering ratio. For me, it's totally fine steering ratio. I would not really recommend to put in a faster ratio. Also, a slower ratio is not recommended by me. The reason for that is the following. What does the steering ratio? A faster ratio makes you react quicker in the steering. Of course, this is just makeup. Why is that? Because the car is actually not reacting quicker, it's just you are steering quicker and therefore the car is um, it's made to react quicker, yeah? This is hugely negative, negative for your tire wear and front tire um, temperatures and stuff like that. It's not really recommended to go faster. In this car, maybe 14.4 is okay. However, I would also recommend, I would all, ah, I would recommend you all the time just to keep to keep the 15 to 1 ratio. <laughs> that was that was hard. Next thing, caster angles. A higher caster value helps to stabilize the car. In my opinion, the default values work quite nice. However, increasing that by one click to 6.4 help the car to be a little bit more stable on the corner entry. That's not the main purpose of the caster. Here's something <coughs> I, read ab I read about the caster today and the physics behind it is quite complex because it's totally in connection to all the other settings on this page. So it, it's not just changing the caster angle 
and this is uh, some independent um, change. No, 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 it's dependent on all the other settings you can see here. However, with the whole setup um, combined on track, I felt like 6.4 gave me more stability on corner entries without getting me too much into the understeering problems. So this is the setting I re recommend you here. Camber, well that's a whole story um, per se. Why is that? You probably know the problems with the camber. There's currently an exploit. Well, it's not really an exploit because it's um, the physics behind it that if you go um, very low on camber, and I don't mean negative camber, I mean um, low camber um, absolute, so to um, values of a zero or near zero values, you get quite an amount of top speed and you don't lose so much grip compared to that. So generally if you want to get faster on fast tracks you need, right now I have to say, you need to reduce the camera. However this video will be online quite an amount of time and I think the camera um, fix will be around within the next month. So. I, w I won't recommend you to go very low on the camber right now here. Yeah? So we just leave it at default. Well, not at de not completely at default because I think the car felt best with two in the front right now. Well, it's just feeling now, no performance. And in the rear we are reducing it not by the same amount but by one click more. That also helps to um, reduce a little bit of oversteering on some tracks. Yeah? The camber settings are quite sensitive in the, in the grip overall and in the balance between front and rear. So be careful with changes here. If you want to gain the top speed, if you want to use the exploit always uh, reduce front and rear by the same amount so you don't destroy um, the balance of the car completely okay tow in well tow in helps as the little text states here with the straight line stability to be honest in the Aston Martin we don't need straight line stability we really, really don't need it. We need a car which is more responsive. So the rear, the front toe in is totally fine. You need a little bit of negative toe in, toe out for the steering and a little bit of positive toe in, in the rear for accelerating. However, mm, we don't need uh, that much. 0 0.4 degrees, that's too much. No, we don't need that. This will also cost you a little bit of top speed. So, nope. We don't need 0 0.4, we don't need 0 0.3, maybe 0 0.2. I also drive it with 0 0.1. That doesn't make a huge difference then anymore. 0 0.2 is okay for the car. Also, with higher values here, we would have more tire wear and more or higher tire times in the rear. And we don't want that. Okay. Next page. And this is also the last page. Downforce. Front and rear. I kind of feel it's the, the setting here is strange. I mean downforce is not a very complicated settings, you probably all know or it also states it here on the text. Lower downforce <laughs> is lower aerodynamic grip and more speed. So I'm totally okay with the front downforce on this car, it's 
wonderful, it helps to get around the corners and it doesn't cost you too much speed on the straights. Front downforce adjustments, maybe if you reduce it to zero you get like mm, 10 km per hour, maybe around 8 maybe, it's not, not a huge difference, I just wanted to say. However, the rear downforce is quite high here and I don't really understand that. The car is not um, oversteering in, in fast paced corners and this is what we are talking about if we are talking about downforce. It's um, more understeering. If I think about Spa, if you go through Pujol, I hope I pronounced that correctly. <coughs> that would be much too much. Um, 9 in the rear is, is much too much. Um, I usually use 5 or 6 here. 5 is okay on many tracks, however during the braking phase you might want a little bit more rear stability and of course there it helps to have more um, aerodynamic in the rear, downforce in the rear. So I recommend 6 as a value here. The other value, um, if you want to go down on faster tracks like Monza, would be 0 and 3. Spa being something else, I use a 0 and 2 there. However, here on our um, baseline setup, we are using 1 and 6 anyway. Okay? Weight bias. In the past I reduced it to the rear to get better traction um, on acceleration. However, I don't do this anymore. I don't want to disturb the weight bias of the car, which is quite nice. As I said, it is 50-50 or near 50-50. So I'm just leaving it at the default value. You can play around with that, you can definitely feel the changes. I don't recommend to put it to the front however, um, because that might just be too much for the front tires, too much weight on the front tires. It helps you with a turn in, better turn in, less understeering, however it might also be too much weight and uh, the tires might just give up after all. So we leave it by uh, at 50.5. A thing you need to consider here is um, the fuel. If you are on a longer race and uh, you fill up the tank to 106 liters, which is the maximum, the weight balance um, shifts a little bit to uh, well, compared to 5 liters. The tank is, I, r I read about this, I googled it, um, behind the driver, so the weight bias uh, should not be uh, bothered too much from um, different um, uh, different um, liters, uh, different amount of liters. However, you can use the weight bias a little bit, because the um, uh, tank is behind the driver, I'm pretty sure there is more weight on the rear, the weight balance shifts a little bit to the rear with a full fuel tank. So you could put mm, this value a little bit to the front to counter that if you are um, planning on driving with um, many or much fuel in the tank. However, if you are driving only short races, you might also put this value to the rear. Yeah. However, for a baseline setup we just leave it like it is. Well, then we are through. I have a cheat sheet over there, so I will see if I forgot anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Da, 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 da. I, s I told you about the camber more stability, more camber is more stability in general. You can feel that quite nicely. However, uh, it might be a little bit too much on default. Uh, and don't go 
too low on the camber because there might be a camber exploit fix in the future so the advantages you get from that regarding top speed might not be there in the future anymore. Right height almost no effect on top speed I, n I noticed corner speeds are better with lower right height I told you that but we are leaving the default value. Rear wing, ah I forgot to mention you I in my tests adjusting one click of rear wing gave you like one or two kilometers per hour so if you are reducing three clicks um, of rear wing you can calculate with four maybe five kilometers per hour on top speed gain okay all in all you noticed we softened the car by quite an amount I told you the reason why if you forgot bumps and curbs are the main reason and the car just feels better with a softer suspension that's definitely the case so that's all I'm afraid regarding the car setup however we have another thing to consider here which is the force feedback this is highly subject subjective of course um, everyone m maybe want to use um, specific force feedback settings and it also excludes um, drivers who use um, gamepads and keyboards however for all the wheel users a, a short reminder I use a Logitech G25 so the settings I will explain to you now are um, specific settings for my wheel of course since the patch I have problems with a really high force feedback and I'm missing details with that force feedback is clipping quite much so the first thing I did to counter that was reducing the master scale to 22 from 26 that helped greatly of getting back some details however there is another thing um, Jet Pistol told me a little bit about the FX, FY and FZ scale values so FZ scale values should be a thing for um, bump and curb behavior so um, the behavior um, you have uh, in the up and down directions these are a little bit too much if you ask me driving over the bumps your steering wheel gets loaded quite much and you are missing the details you need from the bumps you know the um, the bumps get so much information into the wheel that you are losing the actual information on the way so I reduce that that value to 65 yeah about well between 60 and 70 let's say like that it's not that sensitive now also the FY scale which is um, long, 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 I think that's the longitudinal tire forces. Kill me if that's not right. No, don't kill me if that's not right. <laughs> um, however, I reduce that to the same amounts that um, help to reduce the forces in general which um, gave me more details back as well and then the next setting I did I increased the FX scale to 120, 130 something in between and that helped to get more details for understeering and oversteering mainly oversteering of the car and this helps to keep the car on the road in extreme situations you feel more details with that in those situations so that's all for the setup and for the force feedback setup going to the summary here for the final shot of that so you have an overview and 
that's it for that. Let's get over to the final thoughts on that. So, what do we do with the baseline setup now? Good question. Answer, drive it everywhere. I don't see a reason why you won't be using this setup on any any track. Well, I do have some reasons. The setup we worked on today is basically fine for tracks like Imola, Laguna Seca, just the medium sized tracks you can find in project cars. It might not work so well on tracks like Silverstone. You may know I made a setup one for Silverstone. Uh, basically I wasn't so satisfied with it as well, but well, I tried. Also a Bruno in Czech Republic special track won't be working so good there. Really hard to set up the car for those tracks. Also on tracks like Prance Hatch it might need some adjustments, for example more right height and a even softer suspension. And on faster tracks like Monza you probably need less downforce and the longer gear set. So all in all I hope that helps you a little bit, more setup 101s are on the way, they will follow and in case of the SM margin we will start at the baseline from now on. So the future setup 101s won't be as long and exhausting, I just need to adjust our baseline setup from now on. So that's it, thanks for watching, see you next time and bye bye.